Sorry for the slight delay, but the spirits move us. We do not move the spirits. <laughs> it's uh, my pleasure to welcome you all to the first ever DePaul Humanities Center Humanities Seance. Yes. Now, in order for this to work, we need everyone to remain as quiet as possible. That means please silence your cell phones. Please darken your cell phones. Please stay in your seats unless there's a genuine emergency. We need to cooperate with the spirit world. And now, please join me in welcoming our Master of Ceremonies, the Director of the DePaul Humanities Center, H. Peter Steves. Someone was going to call or text you, and then they suddenly did. 
Not really. <laughs> That's perfect. From now on, can you speak into the microphone, please? Thank okay. You. So, you would say that you are not a very psychic person who's open to all sorts of manifestations. Yeah. No, not at all. That's wonderful. That's why the spirits have chosen you tonight. Yeah. So here's what we're going to do. We want to summon someone from the history of the arts and humanities. To narrow that down, I've listed about 60 names in this book. In fact, would you take the flashlight here? Help me look, it's kind of dark to see. But I'm going to go through some of these. Say some of the names with me. Mary Shelley. Mary Shelley. Oh, oh, Emily Bronte, Jane Austen, Pablo Picasso, Charles Dickens, Sigmund Freud, my Angelou, John Cage. Lots of them, right? Lots of them. You don't have to do them all. You don't have to do them all. It's okay. It's okay. I'm going to ask you to put the microphone in your right hand and to take your left hand and place it on top of the pad. Your left hand is the sinister hand. All of your energy will be flowing through it. And here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to turn my back. And I'm going to ask you to take that left hand. May I touch your left hand? Yeah. To take that left hand, yeah. lift up a page anywhere you want. Okay. Take a peek inside. Use the light here if you need to. Take a peek inside and then close it immediately and don't say it. Okay. No, All right? No, no, no. So any place you want, lift it up and take a peek. You ready? Yeah. Go. Yeah. You got it? Yeah, I got it. Okay, close it. Do you know the person that you chose from the book? Yeah. I learned about him in life. Don't say anything? <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what this person looks like? Kind of. Kind of. I want you to picture this person. I want you to picture his or his. <laughs> it's a nail, is that right? Yeah. I want you to picture his name and an image of this person. An artist of some kind, a writer, a writer? Yeah. A writer? But he doesn't write novels or short stories. Right? Does he write plays? Yes. <laughs> I'm feeling the presence of William Shakespeare in here. So yeah! Yeah! Do you feel it? Can you feel him? Yeah. You feel him? You feel the spirit? Open yourself up to it. Now, because spirits are not around long, we'll just see if we can get them to do a couple of things with us. The most difficult, of course, is possession. William, you've been gone for a while. You've been a shadow or a shade. Perhaps you could do something with shadows, and then I could... Be... No? <laughs> oh. Oh, do you know what he's saying? He's saying that he'd like to do something with shadows, but he would like to be the one who physically does something in the real world, possessing my body as I interact with the shadow world. Yeah, I should say yes. You think what? He wants to know if he'll stand up, please. I think he wants to sit there. Please come over here with me. Hmm? I'm not going to ask her. No. He wants to know if it's all right if he touches you in some way, not an intrusive way, but you're touched, touched by a spirit. Is that all right with you? Okay, he's keeping up with the times. All right, let's do this over here. David, could you turn on the spotlight for us? Could you have a seat here?
Take the microphone again. <laughs> Thank you. That's pretty blind, blinding, right? All right. Now, normally, what I would do is I would do something fit. Yes, I'm getting to it. I would do something <laughs> physical, and then the spirit would make something appear in the spirit realm. But he's asking me to do the inverse. I'm going to interact with shadows, and something physical is going to happen. That's cool. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to ask you to put on a blindfold. <laughs> this is the most crucial moment of the possession. I'll need absolute silence. Absolute stillness. Are you ready to begin? Yeah. Pick up the microphone. Put that in your hand. Keep that near you. Don't say anything until you're instructed, but open yourself up to a physical manifestation. Okay. Are you ready? Yeah. Did you feel anything? Yeah. What did you feel? Like a tap. A tap? Where? Here. Oh. <laughs> On the left shoulder. <laughs> and you felt it more than once, didn't you? You felt like a double tap? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah, basically. Oh, interesting. Could you take off the, the mask for me? He's here. He's here with us. Could you please stand in the center of the room? Could you remind me of your name again? Estre. Estre. It's a beautiful name. What's in the name, by the way? <laughs> an S and then J. It's beautiful. What is in the name? A rose by any other name would smell. Ah. Okay, okay. We can, yes, we can make this happen. Stay right there, right? I've got an idea. A dead DePaul plant. <laughs> Shakespeare has been among the dead for centuries. And now, from death, life. Hum, everyone hum with me. Mm -hmm. Help them to manifest. Mm -hmm. He needs to leave. <coughs> All right, fine. William, how will we know when you've left? <coughs> how will we know you're no longer with us? Thank you. 
having difficulty, so I want to respect your time, but we may end closer to 9, 10, 9, 15, if that's all right with you. Um, before we get started tonight, I want to begin as we always begin here at the Humanity Center by acknowledging the traditional territory upon which we gather this evening. Long before Europeans arrived on this land, uh, there were numerous native people who sought to walk gently here. They offered assistance to the first European travelers to this territory, sharing their knowledge for survival and living a good life. Among others, the Potawatomi, Ojibwe, Miami, and Illinois inhabited what is now this part of Chicago. And while we here today have no power to honor the treaties that were signed, we do recognize that these treaties were brokered under some duress and deception. So it's our hope tonight to honor the good faith with which the native people of the region entered into these treaties. As Potawatomi Chief Matea is purported to have said at the signing of the 1821 Treaty of Chicago, this is a small piece of land. If we give it away, what will become of us? The great spirit who has provided it for our use allows us to keep it. In solidarity with Chief Matea, we recognize the history and legacy of this subjugation, as well as the enduring presence today of Native Americans among our faculty, staff, student body, and community. And it's thus that we seek a new relationship with the original peoples of this land, one based on true respect, as we also reaffirm our general and driving dedication to finding ways both institutionally and personally for the work that we do at the DePaul Humanity Center to be a model of what it means to be dedicated to making our society a more enlightened and just place for everyone in our community. <clears throat> So, it will soon be my honor to introduce our special guest. And on the way toward that, I thought I would offer a few preliminary thoughts about why we are indeed very lucky to have him with us tonight, and why this movie we all just witnessed is so shockingly, disturbingly, brilliantly horrific. Now, <clears throat> from a pantheon of topics larger than the list of all of the major and minor demon kings in hell, I will limit myself to just two main points here, though I truly think we could easily spend the next month together talking about this film and this writer-director. The first theme that might be worth some focused thought tonight has to do with what actually constitutes art in general. The second is related to the question of how families operate and how, due to forces beyond their control, they might be a source of terror. When art is made, that is, art about art, this is a tricky business. Self-referentiality is always challenging, said the man talking about self-referentiality. We are reminded of Plato, who in the Republic runs all of the artists out of town and banishes them from utopia, essentially because art is always a lie, getting us further away from truth and blinding us to this fact in the process. Yet, Plato does this. He argues in favor of all of this by means of writing beautiful words, usually in the form of a dialogue that's a lot like a play, while playing, paying attention to the poetry of the language he's chosen to express his points. In other words, he artfully speaks out against art. It would no doubt be wise to pause for a moment before thinking we have easily understood this argument. I don't believe that art is a form of lying. On the contrary, I think it's a way of expressing truths that cannot be put appropriately into words. We are driven to make art, to state what cannot be stated, and we are driven to experience art, to be overcome by something that transcends the rational structures of logos, because we know that truth is far more nuanced than what our shallow propositions can handle. What are we to make of a movie, then, that in its first moments places all of the action inside a fictional space? Hereditary starts with a shot looking through the window outside the family house at that tree house in the back. The camera then turns, as we're seeing, shows us a version of Annie's workroom with her miniature scenes and houses in it, and then <clears throat> it slowly zooms in to the diorama of the miniature she's done of her own house, which is where all of the action of the movie then unfolds. Now, following the logic of the continuous zoom, the people in the movie are miniature, dolls, playthings, fictional characters operating inside a dream world. The camera, as it's pulling in now, never pulls back. It never suggests that we ever leave this dollhouse, which means that the two-hour story unfolds in that space. It also means that that house, which contains a workroom itself, 
most likely has a miniature house in it that contains a workroom in it, which most likely has a miniature house in it that contains a workroom in it, and so on. Who knows at what level of reality we really find ourselves? The particular sort of self-referentiality at work here is fascinating, precisely because the camera shot creates, apparently, a fictional space inside of a fictional space. No one goes to a movie screening of a film such as this and mistakes what takes place for a documentary. There's no attempt to trick us into thinking that the story is real in that sense of the word real. So we don't really need to be told that what's about to take place is a fiction. Yet Ari Aster seems to insist that it's necessary to ground his film in this way. And in his hands, notice that the double fiction is something that creates a space in which he might once again make a claim about the real. That is, we go to a movie knowing it's a fictional world. One way for that movie to try to make us believe it's real is to trick us by claiming it's real. We're usually too smart for that. We know that a claim of truth inside a fictional narrative is itself a fiction. But if the fictional space acknowledges that it knows it's a fictional space, if it points out that it's built on an artifice, if it draws attention to its status as a work of art rather than trying to deny it, it can then speak with a new veracity. It speaks a new species of truth. It knows, and it knows that we know. And in a single moment, our attitude adjusts, and we're now beyond the binary of truth and lie, fiction and nonfiction, real and imaginary. We're open to a different sort of truth, one that knows that some truths can only be expressed in art, and if they were to be expressed outside of art, they might appear to be lies. As the action begins, we are poised to learn and discover and be overwhelmed emotionally and intellectually as a corner of the veil is lifted from the world. The art has, in effect, found a new truth, the layer of truth that exists two layers beneath fiction. Let's be aware, too, that the house in which the movie was shot was itself a work of art. That house was built room by room on a movie set in Utah. It was, in essence, a large-scale miniature, a dollhouse for the actors. And with the ability to remove an entire wall for each room in order to get dramatic shots from a distance, the set more or less appeared exactly like the dollhouse in the first scene of the movie. The fourth wall not only broken, but missing completely. I think, for instance, of Stanley Kubrick's The Shining and the scene in which Jack looks down on a model of that iconic hedge maze. As the camera zooms in, we're about to see that Wendy and Danny are inside of this model. Jack standing above the whole scene. And this says something interesting about whether or not the rest of the movie, and thus the murders, just take place in Jack's mind. And it says something about the patriarch as God. But it doesn't open up the narrative space that Ari's film opens for us to think that some deeper truth is sneaking in through the cracks in this film. Astor is, on, is in some sense taking responsibility in a way that Kubrick is not. Stanley's movie is a bit controlling. Ari instead seems to be not only guiding us, but taking the trip with us, feeling compassion for his subjects in a way that Kubrick's work, amazing as it is, can sometimes avoid. Throughout Hereditary, there are occasional reminders of this to keep us on track. The treehouse is often framed through a window as if it's a work of art. Annie's miniatures are so realistic that we are momentarily confused. In fact, we see Annie living her life with her family through her art more effectively than she's living it with her actual family. Even at the very end, as King Pyman is being hailed inside the reluctant vessel of Peter, the film once again shows us a diorama of this scene, a dollhouse miniature of the moment, frozen in time, shot from a distance, as if spread out on a black cloth of night, the circle complete, the story told, the truth revealed. Art in general is an important theme throughout the film, from the doormats and other sewing projects that Annie's mother created, which proved pivotal to the plot, to Charlie's drawings and little sculptures. While Annie is making her miniature dioramas in her workroom, her daughter is making miniature King Pymans from pigeon heads, pins, spools of thread, and other found objects. And there there's the automatic writing flip book of Peter without eyes, too. There is always an interpretation of art. There is always an art to interpreting texts. Because every human action necessarily involves perspective, culture, history, and a vantage point, every act of reading is an interpretation. It's a retelling. There is no literal reading of a text. 
because that would assume that words have meaning outside of context, that all of the hermeneutical intertwinings that give rise to meaning itself can be put out of play. The notion of a literal reading is itself a kind of nonsense. The art of interpreting a religious text, then, is paramount to discovering its meaning. If we take the film's Pyman cult as an example, we might say that the cult is based on a serious misreading of Christianity. In fact, we might even see the Pyman cult as a metaphor for many strains of institutionalized Christianity today. Consider. Those in the cult believe that worshiping some sort of magical spirit will bring them power and wealth. They forsake the body, believe that the suffering will be rewarded later. They're content to harm those who are outside of their own circle of beliefs. The note that Annie's mother left for her read in part, try not to despair your losses. Our sacrifice will pale next to the rewards. It's a cult based on seeing the punishment of another's body as somehow a good thing for themselves. And there are many factions of Christianity that are not too far from this same set of beliefs. They focus on the passion of the Christ over all else, without much, with much talk about the cleansing of blood. They believe that suffering will be rewarded, that rewards will come eventually, that the body is separate from the more important soul, that a central male figure will be like a king whose kingdom will come and who will bless them all for their unwavering faith. Now, I don't mean any to be sacrilegious in any of this. On the contrary. I mean to suggest that some of these problems stem from a misguided attempt to take religious texts literally and to fail to enact the art of interpretation and thinking about them that would actually lead to living under their truth in an authentic way. For whenever Christ talks about his mission and his end game, he never says that the point of it all is to suffer, ignore flesh, wait for riches, and worship him because he's a powerful magical spirit with supernatural abilities. Instead, he says, we should become revolutionaries, feed hungry people, stop fighting because we replace hate with love, take care of those who are sick, tend to prisoners and the infirm and the most marginalized in our society, give away our wealth, and stop longing for a heaven after death because the kingdom of heaven is spread upon the earth though you do not see it. Heaven becomes spread upon the earth precisely by our willingness to act as if it's already here. The focus on the blood, the death, the sacrifice, the rejection of flesh, the rewards, the magic, is to miss the point of it all completely. Yet, many Christians live exactly this way. And it's a way that's not too far removed from the Pyman cult. A beheading stands in for a crucifixion on some level. And artistically, at least, this makes perfect sense. For the head is thought to be the place in which all sorts of magical and immaterial things live. The mind, consciousness, and if Descartes was right about the pineal gland, maybe the soul. <laughs> to be brought the head of someone is to be brought something that at once represents everything they are, and also, because it's just flesh, everything that is unimportant about them. Peter smashes his against a desk, Annie saws her off, hers off, Charlie repurposes bird heads before losing her own. As David Bowie once sang, lamenting wasted time on earth and misplaced passion, living a life without art. Feed me no lies. Close me in the dark. Let me disappear. Bring me the head of the disco king. Well, let's admit that Hereditary's beheadings might have spawned some awesome ideas for Halloween costumes. But <laughs> let's also acknowledge that the film is saying something deep with all this imagery. To be brought someone's head is to have the most important and unimportant part of that person in a culture that believes in dualism, a culture without much hope and without much subtlety in the art of arts. So, Hereditary brilliantly shows us the importance of art when it comes to text, culture, and human life in general. And Hereditary creates a double fiction space, a house inside a house, to anchor truth and expose what is true, but cannot be so easily put into language. But what truth is this, then? And can we say anything about it without twisting it in the act of saying it? So I think we've already seen some of these truths, but in conclusion, I'd like to suggest that one of the most important has something to do with family. And as a bridge to that, we might notice that in this film, it's the women in the family who are the artists. It seems that artistic skill is passed down from daughter to daughter, almost hereditarily. The men, at least, don't seem to be artistic at all. They're kind of quiet nobodies, really. <clears throat> In some deep way, this makes sense. 
Biologically, women are the true artists, the ones who make life out of lifelessness. They're the ones who can actually create. And of course, in part because of this, women have faced a misogyny that manifests itself not only in the everyday particular actions of some men, but in the structures of patriarchal institutions that are all around us. It's easy, perhaps, to read hereditary as a meditation on what happens when a family becomes so laden with tension, secrets, and lies that it can create nothing but trauma and grief. Many great works of art have shown us examples of this, the family in crisis. But I think that hereditary is actually giving us something much deeper. Because Ari is so adept, especially at mixing the elements of horror and the everyday, we begin to see that it's not this family that's falling apart, but rather that all families are built on the same tragic foundation. It's a theme that was there in his early short films, in the complicated sexuality of 2011's The Strange Thing About the Johnsons, in the doting and deadly love of a mother in 2013's Munchausen, and even in the familial murder-suicide that set the events of this year's Midsummer in action. In Hereditary, it comes at us full force. Charlie must die because Pyman needs a male body. And of course Pyman must be male. Men started families, and then they ruled them. Families are patriarchal from the beginning, and women and children have suffered the most. Historically, the nuclear family essentially rose out of capitalism, as a man needed a male heir to whom he could pass along his inheritance. Once you spend your life accumulating a lot of stuff, eventually you run the risk of realizing that you sort of maybe wasted your life accumulating stuff. The man thinks, wow, when I die, I don't take any of it with me. Did it amount to nothing? So by having a male heir, a little mini-me to whom he can give his collection of stuff, he can trick himself into thinking maybe it was all worthwhile. In Hereditary, the stoic father doesn't really do much, which is typical. <laughs> Steve doesn't much help anyone or participate in anyone's life. His idea of helping his wife at first is just to hide things from her and lie to her about her mother's grave robbing for her own good. And when he finally gets engaged, he screams at her over the phone, I have a son to protect. And then the cat's out of the bag. Because incubating sons is what family's always about. So if women are reduced to their roles as wife and mother, identified with reproductive labor, which is not paid labor, discouraged to give themselves completely to productive labor by, for instance, hiring women at 75 cents on the dollar to do the same job that a man does, then when women are not performing appropriately under this system, they will be seen as crazy or evil. There is no other category for women who don't fit in. Annie, by admitting that she wanted to have an abortion when she first learned she was pregnant, by admitting she didn't want to be a mother, can only be seen as crazy which is her psychiatrist husband's silent diagnosis at first, or evil, which is her own worry because she's internalized the ideology of her oppressor. By sleepwalking and trying to kill her kids, she was, of course, trying to save them, trying to make it such that they could avoid their fate within this family. But she can only be conceived of as a monster for attempting to destroy the most important tradition that patriarchy uses to keep afloat. After all, when Susan Smith drowned her children in the lake back in the 90s, opinion polls showed that many Americans thought that she was, as one headline put it, more evil than Hitler. How is a mom killing two kids seen as worse than a man killing six million people in concentration camps and starting a war in which 75 million more people lost their lives? Because a male seeking political power through violence at least makes sense in our current paradigm. A woman who is the opposite of what a mother is called on to be? That's just nonsensical. When Pyman is trapped inside of Charlie, of course he can't be the leader of the family. Patriarchy doesn't work that way. He doesn't even really have a voice because male authority can't speak from such a vantage point. Charlie merely clucks along, not in full position of language, rationality, or logos in general. She is guttural. And, like the Greek tragedies referenced throughout the film, when Annie tries to escape her fate, tries not to be like her mother, tries not to be what she is forced to be in a family, it is inevitable that she will fail. No one woman can change that. As long as the institutions remain the same, there's no way to have a different future. Which means we have to work to change things in a radical way. 
This seems to be the lesson in one of Annie's dollhouse sculptures, the one that's beside the staircase that shows house upon house, built upon house upon house, the force of the inherited story and history of the structures themselves, surely crushing everyone inside. And the film shows us then how children suffer within the confines of patriarchal family. Charlie especially, of course, she's literally possessed by a male spirit her whole life. But even Peter suffers, because until he inherits the control of a family of his own, he'll be nothing but a child, someone without real rights or moral standing in a society outside of the boundaries of his family. And so the family destroys him as well. I think of the poet Philip Larkin, and one of his most famous works of art, This Be the Verse. Larkin saw that families pass on horror to its children, though he failed to see that the forces of alienation, neoliberalism, capitalism, and patriarchy are all at the heart of this. The final verse of this three stanza poem is Larkin's own version of hereditary. He writes, man hands on misery to man, it deepens like a coastal shelf. Get out as early as you can and don't have any kids yourself. What we want for our kids, whether that's to graduate from college, to have a higher standard of living than we did, to go on to be a doctor or a lawyer or a demon king of hell, whatever we want for our kids is our projection onto them, and it can't help but do damage, even when we think it's for their own good. So I'll close here, admitting, however, that I don't think that Philip Larkin knows the deep truths that exist in the cracks within the broken fourth wall in the rooms inside the house that Ari Aster built. There's nothing supernatural, supernatural that's scarier than the forces that promote our suffering in real life. And what we truly inherit is not a genetic code that determines our future, but instead a set of traditions embedded within horrific institutions. We don't need gene therapy to fix the problems of heredity. We need real community. We need love, non-chivalrous love that doesn't merely tolerate difference but embraces it. We need to organize and work together so that we have the power to play a completely different game rather than just hope for a nicer outcome within the current game. We need revolution. And for that, we need a revolutionary art that allows choose to be exposed as never before. This is what I see in Ari's films, in his creative genius, in his unbleaking eye that is willing to stare up at the dark corner of the ceiling where our mother who has been possessed by our father should not be huddled waiting to spring down. For it takes a talent like this not only to help us keep our heads, but to learn how to use them appropriately. It takes a writer who knows how to craft the words and a director who knows how to tell a visual story. It takes a writer-director who moves us deeper into the dollhouse because he knows that's where the new truth resides, in the spaces between fiction, which are the farthest thing from a lie. How fortunate our culture is to have such a guide to move us through the gore and beyond the door of domestic horror. How fortunate you and I are that he is right here with us tonight. Friends, please help me welcome to the DePaul Humanity Center stage, Ari Aster! Okay, you there? Okay. Yeah, yeah, awesome. All right. All right. Woo. <laughs> Indeed. Wow, that was, that was great. Thank you. Oh, no, thank you. Thank you for being there. Thank you for making this movie. <clears throat> so um, as, as I was watching it with such a big crowd, thank you all for being here, by the way. We have a humongous crowd. Um, and I hadn't seen it actually with such a large crowd before. I went to see it late in the theater and then I watched it a couple times myself. One of the things that struck me just now was how often people laughed. Yeah, that's yeah. good, that's good. I didn't watch it because I 
I can't watch my films with an audience. Um, I understand. But uh, <coughs> have you seen it with an audience before? Yeah. <coughs> yeah. We we we. I there were a few screenings that I sat in on. Early, Early on, I, I sat through two screenings at Sundance, and one was very big, and and there was one that had a lot of laughter in it, and that that's good. I feel like mi Midsummer people know that it's supposed to be funny, <laughs> but it's supposed to be funny. Well, I, I think they're both supposed to. Well, they're both funny to me. Uh huh. Um, Say it, a little it, bit more about that. <laughs> well, just it, in certain in certain places, they're yeah. funny. Um, I see Midsummer as being sort of a dark comedy. This one is a tragedy, but I mean, Charlie's head coming off, I feel like that, com <laughs> that comes from my sense of humor more than anything else. <laughs> Fascinating. Fascinating. So it seems to me sometimes when, when we have a, a strong emotion, Sometimes it's hard to control how it comes out. It could be crying or it could be laughter. If there's a moment when there's a kind of eruption or a break in the tension, it doesn't surprise me that people laugh because a laugh is, is a kind of guttural, non-linguistic thing, but also linguistic thing. It kind of breaks up rationality and logos. You know, it's, it's that moment of ah and release. But to say it's actually funny, Seems like it's a different claim. Would you say there's not a huge difference between comedy and tragedy in the end? Um, well, I, so in a way, I feel like we're talking about catharsis. Yeah. Right? And release. And I, I, and for me, what happens to Charlie is not dissimilar to a punchline. Um, mm. But uh, it's not designed to be funny, right? It's not designed to elicit laughter. Right. Um, I find it funny sometimes, yeah. <laughs> uh, especially when I'm in an audience, because I, I, I designed it to do something that I, for some audiences it, it effectively does. Yeah. Um, which is to kind of knock the wind out of you. Um, uh, God, and I had a second thing I wanted to say, but I forgot your question. No, sure. Um, no, it's just, it's really about the distinction between tragedy and comedy and whether that's a valid distinction. On some level, this is kind of the same question of genre. What do you make of genre? Is it, is it important to separate things into categories? Or... I tend to think that sometimes when we do the separation, the separation does a lot of work for us, and then we don't have to think so much actually about the art or whatever we're thinking about, because we think, oh, I know what you are, you fit in this category, so I kind of stop thinking about that. Right. So I tend to think that the less we rely on categories to tell us what something is, the more we're actually gonna think about it together. <coughs> well, I think that's true. Um, genre is interesting because people come into certain films with certain expectations, and genre films kind of provide the expectations for you. Right. Um, and so for many people who are maybe coming in with less of an open mind, um, a film succeeds or fails based on how effectively it, it uh, meets those expectations. Um, I there are many horror films that I love. There are more that I don't. Um, hmm. and especially, I'd say in the last, like, I don't know, 30 years. Um, well, that's not fair. Really, you know, it's, it's, you know s since the, you know, the advent of yeah. the genre in film. Um, but, uh, you know, so I find that many of the conventions are obnoxious, you know, like I don't like jump scares, mm -hmm. I find them irritating, um, and there are a lot of people who went to see this film and felt like they didn't get their money's worth, 
because those aren't being, you know, brandished. Um, but uh, part of the fun of working with genre is that it 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 uh, puts the filmmaker in a position to find new ways of you know of breathing fresh life into a dead horse, yeah. right? And so I didn't want to ignore the conventions. In many ways, I kind of I, I was excited by the idea of making a haunted house movie that acknowledged other films that came before it, right. um, and uh, and then I also was very. It was important to me to kind of ignore the genre while I was making it. When I was writing it, I wasn't quite ignoring it. But then when I was directing it, I just wanted to tell, tell the story as eloquently mm. as possible, um, visually. Right. Um, so I'd like to come back to that in a second, the, the difference between the writing it and the directing it. But before we get too far afield from the expectations, it seems to me that if if people complain because it didn't meet their expectation, that's, that's going in with a real low bar. Because very often those expectations do so much work that the art doesn't have to rise up very much. Like when you, you turn on a sitcom on TV and you say, I know this is a sitcom, then you kind of go along with the laughter. Even when the, the jokes are not very good, there's just a kind of roll with it, you know what I mean? That it just, I showed up, I know what I'm supposed to be getting, and then you just coast on it. Yeah. But to go against the expectations, that seems like it's taking really risks. I think of one of my, my favorite artists. Do you know Andy Kaufman? Of course. Yeah, Andy. so Andy was, he's one of my heroes, and one, one of the things, too. really? Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. No, absolutely. So one of the great things he would do is he would take those expectations and just flip them. Yeah. So he would take, comedy is Tony Clifton character who sang horribly and, and was obnoxious to people, but he wouldn't perform in a comedy club. He'd take him into an Italian restaurant and book him as a singer. And so people didn't know that it was comedy. And so it ends up being a much richer art in that way. Or when he would go to the, to the comedy clubs, he would cry on stage. Yeah. And that would do, right? So that idea of not being allowed to coast along on, on expectations seems like the mark of a pretty great artist. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, in Andy Kaufman's case, that I, I agree. <laughs> um, and I mean, I, I, would not, I would not compare what I'm doing in these films to Andy Kaufman necessarily, because sure. I think his, um, the litmus tests that he, were, that he was throwing out were more radical. Right, it's a spectrum. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, like when he, I, I, I forget, where this was, but but um, but what did he end up reading? Was it like the Great Gatsby? Is the Great Gatsby? The Great he Gatsby went all the way through it from page yeah. one to so to he'd show up day. at colleges with people yeah. expecting him to do a comedy performance, and, he and he'd start the reading the Great Gatsby, and then he would never stop. He yeah. just read the entire novel, and people either fell asleep or they left. Yeah, yeah. which is beautiful, right? Yeah, it's beautiful. <laughs> it's wonderful, and you know, and. They didn't get what they paid for, but right. they got the Great Gatsby. They got some awesome. <laughs> yeah. So I teach, a, I teach a class on philosophy of comedy here. And one of the things that we talk about in that class is there's this long history of thinking that comedy and tragedy are super different. And one of the distinctions that has been there historically has been that tragedy has got to nail the ending. Because tragedy is really about the destination. Whereas comedy is more about the journey. Right. So you can think of some good comedies that are just funny throughout, but the ending kind of fizzles. But supposedly the tragedy is all pointed to that one direction. And it must strike fear and pity. Exactly, the exactly. The, so yeah. does, when you're writing, so let's go back to that question, when you're, you're writing and you're thinking about genre and you're thinking about this as a tragedy, are you thinking about getting to that ending and sticking the landing at the ending? Is that important, or is it more important along the way each little beat? No, yeah. I mean, endings are very important mm. to me. Um, and I feel that any storyteller who doesn't feel that way is wrong. Um, <laughs> but, yeah. Um, 
And yeah, I mean, I, I don't know what to say beyond, yes, the ending is essential. Sure, sure, that's and, fine. And with this one, I, I'm trying to find things to say that I haven't said before, but fuck it. I, uh, so, you know, I, 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 you know, the idea here was, I mean, there, there was a lot that I was doing, and you picked up on so much of it in the way that, in, 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 in what you just read, which was beautiful. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, but the idea was, ultimately, just from, from a story perspective, um, for getting you know what what the film is doing on on all of these like sub levels. Yeah, yeah. It was about making a film that was chronicling this like possession ritual, but from the perspective of the uh, the prey or the the sacrificial lambs. Right. And so, what for them is you know. Uh, a total catastrophe um, is sort of, it, it's a success story for somebody else. Right. And so to end on the note of this success. The success. Yeah, like all of this destruction has resulted in like some sort of birth. Right, Pyman's um, here, chocolate for everybody. Exactly, yeah. and so, um, so the ending was always supposed to be exultant. Um, and so was Midsummer, but in a different way. Um, and, uh, and so what we were cutting the ending with, um, the piece of music that we were using, right. was um, Zadok the Priest, mm. uh, which is you know, the coronation theme. Right. Um, <laughs> and for a while I thought I might use it, but it felt kind of pat and, and s silly, and I'm really happy we just too on the point, too, too. Say what? Too on the on the nose for yeah, coronation. Yeah, there, there was yeah. something a little like snarky about it that that wasn't right. Oh. Um, and then you know, and then we already had Colin Stetson doing the score, and and and, uh, and then I worked with him a little bit on doing our version of it, and it's so much better, right? Um, or at least I think it is than what it would have been. Um, but for me, there was something about, it was that shift in tone where the whole film is kind of, you know, it's just, it's heavy with dread to then kind of end in this maybe lighter, more tonally confused way. Like, yeah. that was the way to do it. And this, this film is, I don't know, it's, it's, it's an interesting thing because so many people, like, get off the ride five minutes before it's over and just think like this thing like fell apart and I, I don't feel that way. I'm, I'm very pleased with the way that, that the film ends. Um, but I, it's been, it was very interesting to see just how divisive really, that that's interesting. proved to be for people. Right. People who otherwise really like the film. The last five minutes. They, the, yeah. Oh, yeah. Could you move your mic up a little yes, bit? It's kind of hard to hear. Sorry. I just I received a message from the spirit world. <laughs> but it's hard to hear you, Ari. <laughs> Is this better? Is this better? Let's ask yeah. folks. Put on your right lapel. Oh, okay. Your right lapel. So while you're doing that, let me, let me ask you this. Um, Is that better? You, yes. How's yeah. that? Yeah? No? Hello? Testing? Okay. Is it me or is it the microphone? Is that better? That's there you better. go. A little bit better. Okay. All right. Do I have to repeat everything I've said so far? Let's start from the beginning. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen. I know. Um, so you, you mentioned earlier that uh, you like referencing other films. That's something that horror films do especially, it seems to me, that there's a kind of reference in there. And that last five minutes where maybe some people get off the bus, that's the kind of Rosemary's Baby moment where right. we find out that everybody is a part of this. But that seems to me a really important moment because, and this sort of gets back to the tragedy and comedy, that if, if maybe Rosemary's Baby started that idea that everybody is doing it, it points to the idea that there's a kind of banality to the evil 
Right. That it's not really about this one supernatural force that has all these powers that's someplace else, but actually it's just all these folks that you know. And there's something super creepy about that, but also there's something that's really funny about that. Like when you find out that your social studies teacher from high school worships Satan, there's just something hilarious about that, right? And there he is with his dumpy body naked in the corner. You, you kind of laugh at that, but you realize, oh, that is evil, right? I mean, that's what evil is. It's when just regular people start doing bad things. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and that, that's something that really bothered me as I was researching the film. I, I mean, I was doing, as I was writing the script, I was sort of, I don't know, I, you, I, I wouldn't call it studying. Well, no, I guess I was. I was like, I, I was reading everything I could on witchcraft, um, but especially like the pragmatic side. Like not like I got into the history of of everything, um, but what I was really looking for were spells and and like mm -hmm. and just and instruction manuals, right. and I found a lot of that stuff, um, and it really bothered me because as I was reading it, I, I you know, you're struck by the realization that you know there are people who sought this out not to write a script, but to right. perform these things. Um, and, uh, and you know, I, I don't know if I'm, if I'm trying to reference films, I think, mm -hmm. in, uh, I, I think I try to be cognizant of what I'm pulling from, and, and I try to acknowledge things. Um, Rosemary's Baby was something, it, it occurred to me after yeah. I had written the ending, like, oh, okay, this is very much Rosemary's Baby. Right. And then the decision came to embrace that um, because ultimately it felt like the only ending that could really exist for this film. Hmm. Um, and, uh, and what was important to me was that, you know, everything be in a sense, literal, like th this was all happening, it's not a dream. Right. Um, <clears throat> and this has all happened. And you know, the film adopts this nightmare logic that kind of takes over. Yeah. And so you know, the family is losing their minds, the film itself is sort of losing its mind yeah. and tearing at the seams. And uh, it was very important to me that even though this was all happening, that the metaphors don't fall apart and don't drop out. So yes, Peter is now possessed by Payman, you know, the eighth king of hell. But the film is also, especially right now at the very end, about trauma, but how trauma can just completely transform a person yeah. and, and not for the better. That makes sense, that makes sense. And also that we imagine that when the film's over, all those people then go about their lives, right? The social study teacher goes back and starts teaching the next day. And that's sort of that banality aspect that this amazing, horrific thing has happened, but it happened because just ordinary people made it happen and they go about their ordinary business. Right. And so I always think of the, you know, the Rolling Stones song, Sympathy for the Devil. I always think that there's a line in that where uh, Mick is singing about all these horrible things that happened throughout history, and, and the line goes, I shouted out who killed the Kennedys, but after all, it was you and me. And so this, this, this idea of we go looking for the one central evil character to blame everything on, but in the end, the bad stuff is you and me, which means taking responsibility for that, which means some people are being happy that something horrible has happened. Right. Yeah. And, <coughs> and even in, you know, just in in the family itself, you, you, know, you have people evading responsibility and doing everything they can to not. Sure. To, well, to shirk, to shirk that responsibility. No, oh, that, that scene at dinner, holy cow, that's a heavy scene. <laughs> They're all just, no one will come clean, and then the, the passive aggressive that becomes aggressive, that's an amazing scene, that, that dinner scene, all right? Oh, well, thank you, yeah, no. thanks. Um, so let me ask you a question then about sort of the technicality of putting this all together. So another theme that, that runs throughout this and that we hear sort of pattering in the background sometimes when Peter's at school is about the question of free will and how much in charge of our lives we actually are. Um, 
it looks like Destiny kind of had everything sealed for the characters in the movie. Do you think, actually, do you think we have free will? What, what's your stance on free will? <laughs> what about humans in general? <clears throat> I wasn't going to ask that, but it seems appropriate. Uh, no, not necessarily. I, I don't think we, I, no, I don't think we do. Um, yeah? So what's controlling it? I, I don't know if it's, like, there's something almost comforting about how, like, you know, airtight this whole thing is. Um, and so I, this doesn't necessarily reflect my worldview completely. This is a pretty nihilistic, fatalistic <laughs> thing. Um, <laughs> But, yeah, I don't know. I, yeah, I, I think we're kind of kites in the wind. Yeah. Um, mm. So, I mean, this suggests, like, a grand design. And I don't see that either. Right. Um, so there's no grand design, but there is a design that we sort of have to follow through. Uh, or something that's controlling yeah. us, you would say, maybe, that... Uh, no, not no. necessarily. I mean, I don't know. Sometimes I look at things and I think, like, this, this is funny. Like, you know, like, it, everything seems to be collapsing right now. Hmm. Um, not just here with Trump and, you know, all that shit. But, but it's happening everywhere. Yeah. Like, there's a Nazi party that's rising in Sweden. Um, and... There's what's happening in England right now, and it's been happening in France. And it's, hap it's really like it's hap I was just in India for a week, and like that's a that's a whole fucking thing, you know. It's just, um, I mean, the government over there, it's, a, it's an amazing country, but right. it's but um, institutions. And, and everybody seems to be feeling the same way, and mm -hmm. I I don't know whether to take. Uh, I don't know whether to see it like in this. I don't know, see like this Hegelian thing happening where like, everything should collapse so we can, so something else can grow out of it or if this is like the beginning of something new. But um, yeah, and it's probably just a, a coincidence, but it's just, it's, it, 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 it does feel as though uh, we're somehow all in sync with each other as, mm. as things happen. Um, uh, I mean, that's all, that's a political point of view, I guess. But, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I don't really believe in anything. Um, I, <laughs> you know, I, it's difficult for the, to, for the philosopher not to take the bait of talking about Hegel, since you just mentioned Hegel. But I won't do that. Let me instead push it this way. So, when you're writing a character, there's a weird relationship that you have with that character in that you can control everything that that character does. So on some level, the character has no free will because you can control it. Do you ever feel when you're writing as if the character wants to do something or something is not authentic to the character, as if there's something that pushes back against you? Or do you feel like it's completely your story and you could make a character do whatever you wanted to, that character to do? <coughs> mm -hmm. I mean, sh I don't know. I mean, I, I feel like, yeah, you could make a character do anything you want them to do, but to your peril as a storyteller, potentially, you know, mm. if you're not considering what, what the movie wants, um, if you're making a movie. Yeah. Um, what, what the, the movie, movie wants? What the, yeah, what the movie needs and what the movie wants. I, I, you know, once you decide what you're making, I feel as though you need to really allow that to take on a life of its own and allow the people within that story to take on a life of, a life of their own. And I, it's, it, with a film like this, which is kind of meant to have this like kind of, the, this Greek quality where yeah. ultimately everything that happens was always fated to happen. Um, you, you have to take that into consideration. Um, when you're building 
when you're building the pieces and just make sure that that finds its way into the architecture of the whole thing. Um, so that answer is yeah. sort of the same answer you gave for free will in, with humans, that, that there's a kind of structure that the structure demands certain things and it's going a certain way, but you can kind of, you know, move a little bit within that structure, something like that. Yeah. Is that sounding right? Um, yeah. Yes. And, and, and what you mentioned about the artist putting himself into the work made me think of, is it in, it's on, it's, it's in Don Quixote, right, where it's like chapter two. Yeah. Um, Cervantes writes himself into the it's crazy into the material, which is extremely it's like postmodern, but like it's the very ago. first novel very ever first written, novel. and it's already postmodern. Yeah, yeah and yeah. you have you have Don Quixote reading the first chapter in yep. chapter two, and it's written by Cervantes, and, and then the he second, criticizes Cervantes. exactly right. It's crazy, which, right? Yeah, and the second volume comes out. There had been somebody else who had published another version, and so the second volume comes out criticizing that not being the real Don Quixote because this is the real one. It's all just self-referential. Exactly. And that's where it begins. That's where the novel begins. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And so, I mean, I even um, I thought about putting myself among the naked. Oh, uh, really? Yeah, I was thinking. I was thinking. So do we like, need to this would freeze the, the DVD, the Blu-ray, and see I'm, if that all came I'm, true? I'm not in there, uh -huh. um, but not because of my body shame. <laughs> good, uh, good to hear. It just, it just did not work out. Just didn't um, work out. But uh, yeah, I mean, that would have been interesting. Implicating yourself. Yeah, but it's fun thing. to think about that. It's fun to yeah, think yeah. about the that that Russian doll. For sure, thing makes know. art really interesting, doesn't it? Yeah. So maybe is it all right if for our last few minutes, if I ask a couple midsummer questions, or we sure. have a little discussion about that? <coughs> I know that's probably been a, yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so you mentioned that you researched witchcraft for Hereditary. There's a different kind of magic that's taking place in Midsummer. It's right. not the sort of Christian-based, it's a more pagan kind of magic that's working there. Sympathetic magic, the baking of the pie to create love, the killing of one thing to represent something else. Do you see those as very different kinds of magic? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, um, there's nothing overtly supernatural right. in Midsummer. Although you could kind of see Horga, the community, as being sort of supernatural, hmm. um, in a sense. Like, they almost, they almost uh, feel like a deus ex machina to me, hmm. in that, I, well, I wanted them to function as this, like, community with, like, a rich sense of history and, and, and deep traditions. Um, and, and a place that, you know, felt real and yeah. lived in. But, and this is something I've talked about before as well, but I, I also wanted them to function as, they could be seen as manifestations of Danny's will. Like, mm -hmm. they have stepped in to give her exactly what she needs. She needs at the moment. Yeah. yeah. And they do almost supernaturally, like, fit her needs. That's interesting. Um, and so, um, and I mean, I did so much research yeah. with Midsummer. It was kind of over the top. But um, what? But the most important research I did w was into certain spiritual movements. So the film mm. is really littered with uh, iconography and all this esoterica, and you know. But but in the end, for me. Um, it was very important that I look into spirit, spiritual movements that actually moved me and that I wasn't skeptical about. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's what the movie needed. The movie did not need to be, like, this place did not need to be this, you know, like, uh, community of kooks. Um, right. That would, like, really cheapen everything. And I, I feel like every, like, so many films I've seen about cults, not that I, I don't think Horga actually quite, uh, uh, it, it, it's not a cult. It's a culture. Yeah, it's yeah. a culture, right. Um, especially because the, there is nobody at, at the head of it. Like right. they, are, they are all, it, it's, it's totally collaborative. Um, 
And so, I, but there are so few films about cults um, that I feel like do the first thing that a film about cults should do, which is make us understand why anybody would join it. Right. Um, and so for me, it was kind of, I wanted the movie to sort of not only indoctrinate like Danny, but also kind of the audience to sort of, right. by the time you get to the ending, you've seen all this shit that's horrible, but it doesn't feel horrible, and somehow you've, like, it's, it's like, it's, it, pa it pacifies you in a certain way, and, and so. Right. That and was the idea, was to, but, it, but the movie is a fairy tale. This, you know, this is a horror film. Yeah. Uh, or, I don't know, this is like a, this is a, um, a, a nightmarish family, tra family tragedy, whereas that, is uh, a breakup movie that is kind of married to breakup a fairy tale. Yeah. And that, that's a difficult thing to get the audience on board with any other culture, really, because cul other cultures always just seem so strange than the one that you're, you're in, right? They, they have an internal logic of their own that it's hard to see when you're not a part of that. Yeah. I think maybe on some, on some level, because culture always is outside of rationality. Like yeah. There are certain things that humans need to do in order just to survive. And then at that point, when you just start making all the little things that make us different, that stuff's outside rationality. So there's no explaining it to anybody. The only thing you can do is to say, because that's the way we do it yeah. around here, right? And that's hard if you're not from around here. So that indoctrination is, is a difficult sort of thing. Yeah. But I, look, I see how we get it at the end. Well, look at, like, look at what we're living in. Yeah, exactly, it's, right? You don't see the ridiculous. insanity. Like, what are these billboards, like posters everywhere? Like, everything's got a brand? Like, it's really insane and weird. Yeah. And we, we don't even notice it. We don't notice that, like, that, I mean, I don't. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, you, whatever you're living in, you live in it long enough, you know, you, you, it, 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 it loses its novelty and becomes just what it is. Right. Um, and there might be something that's more authentic about their culture. And I, I've heard other people talk about how we treat the elderly and that there's something about having them do a kind of joyful party self-sacrifice that might be better than sticking grandma and grandpa in a nursing home in our society. So there's that. But there's also something deeper, too. Um, I don't know if I can put it into good words, but I think my, my wife... Actually, it's, it's, you know, it's time not just to talk a good game of feminism, but to point out that a lot of the things that I think about, I, I think about because I talk with my wife and, and her, her sister, uh, her twin sister, my sister-in-law, and, um, and as a team, sort of, right, we come up with, with ideas about things. And, and one of the things that my wife and my sister-in-law are into now is bullfighting. And you see, there's the one matador in the audience. So let me explain this for just a second, and then we'll tie it, tie it back here, maybe, to, to wrap things up. So this is, this is one that's been hard for me to go along with. But So I've been a vegetarian for 37 years. They're both vegans uh, for ethical reasons, for animal rights reasons. So why bullfighting, right? So the idea, I think, is that in order to live, so for any living thing to live, there has to be death that makes that possible. So I might try to buy good conscience on the cheap by not killing any animals, but I still rely on death for me to take every breath that I have. I'm going to have to kill plants then if I don't want to. I have profited <coughs> from the death of the native people that used to own this land, all, all sorts of things like that. It just seems like on some existential level, it's inevitable and necessary that life demands death. And if that's true, then what do we do about that? So one thing is we could just say, I throw up my hands and I, I kill myself and it's over, I won't be a part of it. But if that would be more death, how do we come to terms with the fact that what it means to be alive is that something is going to die? And that something that dies is always something that we other. We say, well, that's... Even for me, as a, as, a, as a vegan, well, that's not an animal, that's a plant at least. But that plant's got its own thing going on, you know? And I'm just, yeah. I, I'm, I'm ignoring that to do that. So the, the culture in Midsummer, on some level, has kind of accepted this 
and they know that there has to be sacrifice, and they're doing their best to acknowledge it yeah. by bringing in some, something that's outside, making it symbolic, putting inside the bearskin, whatever it's going to be, and saying there has to be sacrifice, and turning it into ritual, turning it into art even, that there may be something more authentic about that than me sitting here in this culture where I try to every day think I'm not causing bad things, I'm not causing death, I'm not causing suffering, when I know that I am. Right. And so there's a kind of authenticity in that culture in Midsummer that we lack. Does that sound? <coughs> yeah, well, you know, again, it's designed to sort of do two things simultaneously. So on one level, they are racist. They are you, you, kind of a, a eugenicist community. Um, they're getting rid of you know, the people of color. And they're getting rid of uh, the white men as well, but not before, or not, not until they've uh, used them for reproduction, mm -hmm. right? Um, in order to avoid inbreeding. Um, and they are, they're doing a lot of ugly things. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and they're justifying it, you know, uh, as, you know, f fairness, because, yes, they're killing this many outsiders, but they're killing just as many insiders, right? Um, and so, again, it's all fair. And then right. so it's, it, it's for people within the community who have volunteered to die, for people from without, and then there's one to be chosen by that year's May Queen. Um, and, uh, and so all of that is ugly, but then at the same time, they are more in touch with each other and the, and the earth and their lives and, and death. And, um, and they believe in this sort of radical reciprocity where they, where whatever they give, they get. And, and if, if one person is, is, uh, is grieving, they're all grieving. Um, which, you know, for one person might be just like a little too much. But for the main character, for Danny, it's what she desperately needs. Um, and so, you know, again, at the end, the movie's about Danny, and hmm. Danny is the heart of the film. Of course. She, she's, and, and the film is sort of revolving around her. Everything in it is revolving around her. Um, and, uh, <coughs> and when I say I see the film as a dark comedy, we, we finally get to the ending. And for me, when we're pulling away from Christian and the Bear, like it's just it's 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 very funny to me. It's very absurd because ultimately it is, you know, he's just he was just kind of a crummy boyfriend. Yeah, uh, <laughs> uh, belongs in the bear suit. Yeah, and so for me, there's something that gets kind of revealed about the absurdity inherent in the film as well. But I'm but at the same time, I'm hoping that you know that it is a film that that both of these are films that take suffering seriously and uh, for sure and kind of you know look straight at it and sort of admit that it's there and admit that it's going to happen and then ask what do we do don't don't blink don't look away but what do we do with it now yeah yeah is there anything you can tell us about what's coming next uh I've been wrestling with a few projects that I have. Um, before I got any of these films made, before I got these last two films made, I had written 10 scripts. Um, wow. Uh, and I want to make five of them. They're, the other five I'm kind of over, but they all kind of need to be rewritten. Um, and so I've, I think I've settled on one. Um, and it's a, it's a it's a nightmare comedy. Um, nightmare comedy. It's it's very absurd. I don't know. It's a, yeah. If I get to make it, it'll be fun. It's it's very. Uh, 
it's it's kind of wacky um, <laughs> s- slash horrible. <laughs> I hope that it's a, a slapstick comedy with lots and lots of head trauma and decapitation, and I hope very much that when it comes out that you'll come back here and let us enjoy it with you and talk to you about it. Thank you so Thank much you. for being here. Thank you.